May the light of Christ who rises this day in glory scatter the darkness of our hearts and minds. Help us to live as people who belong to the light through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have some um, assistants who are going to bring up our Alleluia banner. Do you want to do that right now? There's a tradition in some congregations the Sunday before Lent begins to bury the Alleluia. It's a word we don't say until we get back to Easter. And we didn't bury this, but we can unveil it today. So our kids have been part of creating this Alleluia celebration. Please join me in reciting the collect of the day found on your insert, the contemporary version, the second paragraph. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Good morning and happy Easter. Our first reading today is on the back of the first page of your insert, the second reading um, where it says or underneath. So our first reading today is from Isaiah chapter 65, oh, you're fine, thank you, verses 17 through 25. I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. 
For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 118 verses 1 through 2, and then 14 through 24. We will read this psalm by alternate verse. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim, his mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has punished me sorely, but he did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our second reading is the bottom one from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Peter began to speak to Cornelius and the other Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together. The other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. He said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned, and she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts always be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. There's an English artist that I follow on Facebook I discovered her a couple of years ago because some of the photos that she takes that inspire her work got posted on another site about marvelous Scottish things. 
And if you stick around long enough and learn to know me a little bit, you'll discover I love all things Scotland. So it's no wonder that I'm going to be attracted to this artist who does extraordinary paintings of Scottish seascapes in particular. But she shares other images too in her life. And this holiday weekend there in England, she's Scottish, lives in England with her family. Her family is off the Scilly Islands. That's S-C-I-L-L-Y, not S-I-L-L-Y. And I had to look it up and see where they are. And if you are familiar at all with the geography of England, there's this little foot that distinguish that, what am I trying to say? Extends down off to the left where Cornwall and Penzance, recognize that name, um, is and just go a little farther to the south and the west. And there are a collection of islands known as the Scilly Islands. So the other day when they arrived, she posted this photograph of some ruins. I've learned a little something about these ruins. They were part of a, uh, an abbey that was built in 946. And then it fell out of kind of repair. I think the abbey, the folks who were there at the abbey maybe died out, I don't know. Another collection of monks came and, and took over and it then had another name. And then pirates, of all things, pirates came and sacked the abbey in roughly the 14th, 1400s, but maybe a little sooner. They say that the ruins, this abbey, goes back to the 12th century. So somewhere in the mix of all that is claimed this abbey. Anyway, as you may or may not know, ruins tend to, well, they look ruined. They often, <laughs> they often are missing a roof. They're crumbling. Walls are missing. Windows are definitely missing, all kinds of things. And another part of, of something that distinguishes ruins is that over time, dirt and dust begins to fill in the cracks, especially where walls have tumbled down. And seeds end up being placed in there, or birds drop things. And so you get things growing out of these cracks and along the tops of these walls. They're really rather attractive in an odd kind of way, and very meditative. So. This morning, Hope posts this, Hope posts this picture of this doorway and the wall of this abbey with these crumbled walls. And I said, that's resurrection. That's resurrection. Because today, what do we know about the story of discovering Jesus' resurrection? It involves a doorway, first and foremost. They thought it would have been covered up, and no, the stone has been rolled away. Nothing to prevent access in or out. And then look in the doorway. It's a little dark, but enough light from the outside demonstrates that, wait a minute, Jesus isn't here. They go in. They prove that Jesus isn't there. They go out, and they run off to share the news. Doorway, threshold to discovery and believing. That's what the gospel tells us today. So my ruins, back to my ruins and this archway in the, in the wall, I began to think of it and see it as resurrection for a couple of reasons. One is, imagine the disciples after Good Friday and the death of Jesus thinking, oh my gosh, he's gone. The grief must have been excruciating, devastating. Any of us who have experienced loss or grief know how much it hurts. They must have just been in the darkest of dark places. But grief, as we also know, begins to subside a little bit. Life has a way of depositing a little bit of earth in our cracks, and other things come along to begin to plant seeds. And what happens over time is new life emerges in the cracks and the ruin of what once seemed and felt whole to us. This arch, this doorway, is resurrection. Now in this particular photo, when you look through the doorway, what you see is openness and light, because the roof is long gone. And what seems to, to be apparent is that what's outside the wall and what's inside the wall are essentially the same. But they weren't always. The outside had its own life, and the inside held its own life. But over time, 
what transpired and entered in and out through this doorway shifted and changed and transformed until the two were the same. And yet, the inside will always have been the inside. The outside will always have been the outside. And their relationship is merged through this doorway. For the disciples, the inside of the tomb was dark. But because Jesus was no longer there, there was no reason to linger there. But they held in their hearts the knowledge and memory of their grief. And so they would carry that experience, that feeling and sensation with them. Those of us who know grief know what that feels like. So through the doorway, when we go into what is now whole and restored, we experience light. But we know that what was within held death and darkness, grief and despair. The good news is that Jesus is no longer there, has not been there for a while. No, he's come out and is beginning to make his presence known to Mary and to the other disciples who would eventually share that knowledge and that mystery with the world. That's part one. Part two. Some years ago, I was in a very dark place in my life, hurting. Things had fallen apart, and I felt kind of broken. Life just felt broken. And during that time, I encountered a quote from William Stafford. I haven't been able to locate the full context from which this quote was taken, but for this purpose, that doesn't matter. The quote was this. I have woven a parachute out of everything broken. I have woven a parachute out of everything broken. At that time in my life, what I began to imagine as a person who likes imagery and metaphor, taking, looking at the broken pieces of my life and wondering how I might weave those things together, how I might form a new life using what had been. A little bit like resurrection like what Jesus does with us and for us. And the part that sort of perplexed me was this notion of a parachute. If I'm weaving things together, why do I want to create a parachute? And this week, it occurred to me, what the resurrection does is soften our landing. What the resurrection does is break our fall. What the resurrection does is give us a companion in Christ that sees us through perilous times and delivers us to safety. Who would have imagined Jesus as parachute? And yet that image works so well. The experience of Jesus as a companion in darkness and difficulty works so well as a parachute companion as one who guides me to a landing where I will not hurt myself, who makes sure that my landing is gentle and that if I'm coming in hard, it will break my fall. The resurrection is every bit a part of threshold, doorway, and delivery, of soft landing and about new life, of making it possible to get from one place to another, not easily, but with comfort, with the companionship of Christ and the gift of what God did with him, raising him from the dead. You will also know about me, if you've been around long enough, that I have a favorite poet, what I call a contemporary theologian in the name uh, a person, Jan Richardson. She wrote this about Mary Magdalene, or to Mary Magdalene, on Easter morning. It goes like this. You hardly imagine standing here, everything you ever loved suddenly returned to you, looking you in the eye and calling your name. And now you do not know how to abide this hole in the center of your chest, where a door slams shut and swings open at the same time, 
turning on the hinge of your aching and hopeful heart. I tell you, this is not a banishment from the garden. This is an invitation, a choice, a threshold, a gate. This is your life calling to you from a place you could never have dreamed. But now that you have glimpsed its edge, you cannot imagine choosing so let the tears come as anointing, as consecration, and then let them go. Let this blessing gather itself around you. Let it give you what you will need for this journey. You will not remember the words. They do not matter. All you need to remember is how it sounded when you stood in the place of death and heard the living calling your name. Whether your name is Mary, or Tara, or Glenn, or Eric, or Barbara, or Jeff, or Mike, Jesus calls our name again and again and again. And the whispers of it reverberate in those hollow places of emptiness. But they lead forward into the light, into new life, into new growth into new hope, into resurrection. Alleluia, Christ is risen. In place of the Nicene Creed today, we recite the baptismal covenant, which is found on page 304 in the Book of Common Prayer. Will you please stand and join me in reciting these words? Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers? I will with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. I will with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. I just read that twice, didn't I? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will with God's help. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please greet each other with a sign of God's peace that feels safe to you. You may be seated. Just a word about communion. Um, we are standing at the altar rail instead of kneeling. 
All baptized Christians are welcome to receive communion. If you prefer not to receive communion, you are still welcome to come to the table and receive a blessing. To indicate that, simply cross your hands across your chest. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Prayer D, found on page 372 in the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and fill them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven. We acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. Claim you, holy Lord, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our Creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, destroyed death, and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, 
Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory and offering to you from the gifts you have given us, this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember, Michael, Ian, and Laura, our bishops, Nigerian bishops John and Marcus, and our rector, and all who minister in your church. Remember all your people and those who seek the truth. Remember the Merrill family, Nancy Torchko Zemko, the Rulier family, Silas, Geraldine, the Taylor family, Malaki Roach and family, Ellen, Atfa, Linda, Chuck, Jackson, Amber, Contrinda, Paige, Rosie Grace, and those committed to our ongoing prayers. Remember the concerns and organizations supported by St. Peter's through mission, especially Peace by Peace Quilters. Remember the members of our armed forces serving at home and abroad and for their families, especially Kenneth Fraley Jr., Richard Nunez Jr., Kevin Merrill, Jason Sara, Jason Dorval, and Ryan Waite as well as victims of natural disasters and human violence throughout the world, especially the people of Ukraine. In our parish cycle of prayer, pray for the ministry of the Ladies Bible Chat, for parish members Diane Fernudo, Tara Fernudo, and the Fraley family, Amy Hubini, Barbara Hoff, and Amanda Healy, who are celebrating birthdays this week. We pray for the repose of the soul of Evelyn Merrill, and remember all who have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to you alone. Bring them into the place of eternal joy and light. And grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, with Peter and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
eternal God, heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food, in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be God. Alleluia.